just arrived in Phnom Penh and we're going to go and visit the Royal Palace. Yeah, my ancestors are there. Are Some they? to get tea. Yeah, and I may spend a couple of nights, but I'll see how, how they treat me. Here we go. Well, this makes a change from my usual taxi. <laughs> There's no regard whatsoever for health and safety. I like to think that I'm doing my bit for my carbon footprint. <laughs> Actually, I think it's your driver who's doing the bit for your carbon oh, footprint. I feel as though I've been transported back to the 1930s, just being cycled around the city like this. I've never been in this form of transport before. It is such good fun. We've arrived at the beautiful royal palace in Phnom Penh, which became the capital of Cambodia in 1865 when the royal family moved here. The entrance gate is very tall and narrow because the king always used to travel by elephant and so needed a very tall door to get through. Once inside the palace, you can see this pavilion where the king could have got on and off the elephant at first floor level. And when he wasn't doing that, he could have used these magnificent steps. And here are the wonderful saddles or palanquins used on the elephant. I've seen the king's elephant in there, which was about seven feet tall. Looking at this little chap here, I think this is the sort of elephant that I could control. That's the sort of elephant for Scott man. Yeah, I could control this one quite easy. He's got a wee hat on. I would just have to paint that tartan. Before you know it, we're doing the taxi drive in Framingham <laughs> on Hannibal Miniature 2. <laughs> The Grand Throne Hall is painted yellow to symbolise Buddhism and white to represent Hinduism. It's still used for the coronations of the Cambodian kings today. The closed central door is reserved for the use of the king. I'm not allowed to film inside, but I found this photo of the magnificent golden thrones that it contains. This open pavilion is called the Moonlight Pavilion, and it was used for the banquet at the recent coronation of King Norodom Sihamoni in 2004. But I'm most interested in the genius working at its Base. We just washed Ed Edward Scissorhands there. We need to take him home. Yeah, doing a wee bit of creative work. I'm also completely distracted by the beauty of the royal family's ceremonial robes, made of Cambodian silk and covered with gold. All of the belts and necklaces are made of gold. I could stare at the details on these for hours. But to me, the most fascinating thing of all is that traditionally people wore different colours depending on the day of the week. Apparently, it's because each day is ruled by a different planet and people need to wear a colour that will balance that. An ancient poem explains the colours of the days. Red is for Sunday. Orange truly looks like a beautiful moon. Purple is reserved for Tuesday. Wednesday is the green of the lieb plant. Thursday is the yellowish green of the leaves of a banana palm. Happy Friday is blue and must be tidy. Saturday is the colour of ripe plum, according to the ages. I was born on a Monday. Yeah, yellow is my favourite colour. Yellow is bright, cheerful yeah, and my sunny. Favorite colour too. Next, I'm going to visit the Silver Pagoda, but sadly I can't film inside again. It's called the Silver Pagoda because it's entirely tiled with silver floor tiles, over 5,000 of them. At its centre is a near life-size golden statue of Buddha encrusted with 9,584 diamonds. The pagoda is situated in an enormous courtyard surrounded by walls and each of the walls is painted with scenes from the Rimka, a Cambodian epic poem based on the Ramayana. And we've just been told that tonight we're going to see a dance on the boat based on one of the scenes from this epic. I really want one of these to make into a bed, Gerald. Before leaving the palace, I want to show you these extraordinary trees. They're believed to be sacred sal trees, under which the Buddha was born, and he died in between two sal trees. But some people say that these are in fact cannonball trees imported from South America. Either way, they are spectacular. Now, Stephanie, is this your new form of transport? Absolutely. Okay, this is the best thing ever. Our group is splitting up this afternoon. Most are going to have afternoon tea at Raffles, which sounds lovely, but Jerry and I have made the difficult decision to go to the Killing Fields. But other than the memorial itself, I've chosen not to film any of that because I want this vlog to be a celebration of all that is good in people and all that is kind. Nearly two million people were killed here by the Khmer Rouge under Pol Pot in the late 1970s in living memory. And I didn't feel I could come here without going to pay my respects. Now we're going to go and put a flower down in memory of all of the people who were killed here.
for anyone interested in knowing more, I recommend seeing the 1984 film The Killing Fields, which is based on a true story. Thank you. Hello. Hello, how are you? Very good, how are you? Oh, I love coming back to our cabin. Look at that. The little elves have been. I know, it's like a little oasis of calm. And now it's time to enjoy a cocktail on deck and watch a beautiful traditional dance portraying one of the scenes from the Ramayana. This is the moment when the half-monkey god Hanuman dives into the river because he's furious that the bridge he's trying to build keeps moving. Underwater, he discovers a beautiful mermaid is the root of his problems as she keeps moving the stones. But instead of killing her, he falls in love. This morning we're going to go and experience a Buddhist blessing on the deck of the ship and then we're going to go to see a silk factory. We're on an actual silk island. Four pass and tuk tuk, this is a deluxe limo. <laughs> This is the only way to travel. It is. <laughs> Look, I've got a dog chasing us. <laughs> He's gaining on us. <laughs> this beats a car any day. I would like this bit to be tied into just a bed. Oh, oh no, just a bit of a Yeah, that'd be good. You, you think like I do. <laughs> We're going to see the Silk, silk Island, Island to do some shopping, shopping. <laughs> yes, of locally cool. made silk. And the key word is shopping. shopping. Yeah. So it's just what we call retail therapy. Yeah. We haven't had many shopping no. days. I know, I agree. We need this. Here we're lucky enough to see exactly how silk is made from the moths mating in the first place, which they do for 12 hours. After that marathon, the poor male moths die and the females lay eggs, which turn into these larvae. After several days of eating nothing but mulberry leaves, they start to secrete a silken thread which they wrap around themselves to form a chrysalis. These chrysalises grow and grow, and if left to their own devices, the larva would turn into a moth who would hatch out of it. But in breaking free, the moth would destroy the silk thread, so at this stage the chrysalises are taken and boiled. The boiling kills the silkworm, and then a leaf is used to collect the threads of several chrysalises to bind them together to create one strong silken thread. You can see this incredibly skilled woman doing that here. And it's very hard to make out, but if you look against the dark laundry in the background, you can just see the several threads going into one through that hole. And nothing is wasted because the discarded worms are a delicacy fried in garlic and chilli. The silk is then wound onto this huge bobbin and is ready to be dyed. But what I find most incredible is that this rich yellow gold is its natural colour. The silk weavers place their looms underneath their homes which are on stilts and this way they can work in the day in the shade of their house. The patterns are very complex so traditionally each family had its own design which was passed down through the generations. The skill of these women is breathtaking and I could stand here and watch for hours. Now my favourite bit, we're going to the shop. There's so much to choose from, from plain cotton scarves through to various silk and cotton mixes, all the way up to eye-wateringly expensive silks used for wedding dresses. But I think I've spotted my favourite. I'm very happy because I found the only bright yellow silk scarf in there. Before returning to the boat, we're enjoying a demonstration of an ancient Cambodian martial arts that was used by the soldiers of the king over 1,700 years ago. Obviously, being Glaswegian, Gerald saw a fight and had to get involved. It's been very exciting today. I'm just trying the new scarf. So this is a cotton scarf, but I really love it. It's a beautiful, soft pink. I got this one and of course because it was the only yellow one in the shop Jerry bought me this spectacular yellow hand woven silk scarf and I have to wash it a few times I said about three times and it'll go very soft but isn't that the prettiest colour and then he chose another one for mummy 
which is the same sort of scarf, but a slightly different pattern. And it's this lovely green and yellow, little blue tassels. I love it. It's a good shopping day, Gerald. And thank you for my beautiful, beautiful scarf. Ah, oh, you're welcome. And now before bed, we get to enjoy a traditional Cambodian shadow puppet show. This man and his two wives decide to take a rest whilst walking through the forest one day. They're suddenly attacked by a tiger, and whilst the man rushes to take refuge in the tree, the two women kill the tiger. As soon as he's sure the danger's passed, he creeps out of the tree and pretends to give the tiger the final death blow. When a passing stranger comes along and asks what happened, everyone agrees that he was very courageous and killed the tiger. And this is the most delightful traditional coconut dance. I love watching the world go past That's like this. That's fantastic. It really is great. I could spend weeks on this boat and never get bored. I'm wearing my new pink cotton scarf today. What do you think, Gerald? I think it's very, very fetching. Pink to make the Cambodians wink. Yes, yes, that's exactly what I was going for today. It sort of goes with your pink lipstick. Was this intentional? No, but it was intentional for it to go with the skirt. See? And let's just have a look at this little fashion icon. <laughs> and then we take it up and then we yeah, go yeah, again and now she's doing a wee dance. <laughs> yep. And now we're going to go and see Kampong Chan. I don't know what we're going to see there. I think it's an old French colony. I'll be seeing some of the old French houses. Kampong Cham has always been an important ferry crossing point of the Mekong, as these sculptures of people waiting for the ferry attest. But now there is a brand new bridge. The Kizuna Bridge opened in 2001, and it was the first bridge to be built over the Mekong River in Cambodia. These are all of the French colonial buildings here. It's like going back in time. The French colonised Cambodia for a hundred years and there are signs of their architecture everywhere I look here. I love travelling through these little villages because my French grandfather lived in Cambodia during the French colony and so I feel like I'm retracing my family's footsteps. We're coming out to a village to visit a typical Cambodian house. It's so strange to see people walking out of tiny wood, wooden huts in really remote areas and they're all carrying mobiles. It's like us in a 16th century chateau in the middle of France, all with our mobiles. Same the world over. Like most Cambodian houses, this is on stilts, but being much more modern, they're made of concrete. In the area underneath the house is the kitchen. This is the kitchen. We're told that Cambodians much prefer cooking the traditional way on wood than to use a modern gas cooker because they think it just doesn't taste as good. The waters of the Mekong are very muddy, so during the rainy season, water is collected on the roof and sent through a gutter into these pots. This family are farmers, mainly of lime trees. And the ground is astonishingly fertile. Everywhere I look, there is an abundance of fruit. Here are pomelos, and these are trees filled with enormous jackfruit. And this is lemongrass. I get the impression that there's everything needed to make the most delicious meal right here in this garden. Before we leave, we've been invited to try their bananas and pomelo. I think this banana is the most delicious one I have ever tasted. It's tiny and very, very sweet. Instead of taking the tic-tic back, we're using this bamboo bridge to walk to the other side. It is washed away in the rainy season every single year and rebuilt every dry season. What a lot of work. It's made of 50,000 sticks and spans 3,000 feet. Great bridge. And they build it every year. Every year, what work. It feels quite precarious because obviously the bamboo is really bouncy and you can just see straight through it, but actually it's very strong. And it's quite fun. It's like walking on a trampoline. Are you enjoying it, Gerald? This is the, the, the fourth road bridge. Really? Similar? Yeah. Yeah. It seems to never end. But I would say probably this bridge is built better than the fourth road bridge. <laughs> Needs slightly less maintenance. 
just build a new one every year. We have just walked a really long way in the baking heat. Time to go and shelter in the cool of an ancient temple. This is the 12th century temple of Wat Nokor Bashi. It's built completely from black sandstone and there's a sinister legend surrounding its construction. The locals say that the temple was built by a king who, like Oedipus, accidentally killed his father and married his mother and he then built the temple as his penance. Here's for us, and see which is going. Of all of the things that I was expecting, stepping into an ancient ruined temple, this colourful interior was not one of them. It's incredible to see such an old building, which you presume would be empty and ancient inside, and you walk in and you find this colourful room, like a jewel. It's so unexpected. The modern temple is built in and around the 800-year-old ruins. Every inch of surface area is beautifully decorated. The walls and ceilings are covered with scenes from the life of Buddha. The juxtaposition of old and new, of ancient crumbling stone walls and smooth new columns, rough stone and decorated painted surfaces makes this one of the most magical places I've ever been to. This is my new home. Ah. I just haven't finished building it yet. Just a couple of finishing touches. Indiana McJones's home? Yeah, you go. It's called the Temple of Scotland. Yeah. As we leave the temple, we see newlyweds having their wedding photos taken. It's traditional in Cambodia to have photographs taken in many different sumptuous outfits, and they're rented for the occasion. The town around the temple is full of such shops, specialising in photography, costume hire, hair and makeup. Hello! <laughs> and there seems to be a very meticulous approach to beauty here as they're even selling a cream to whiten one's underarms. As we head back to the boat, I'm struck by the juxtaposition of old and new everywhere in this country. Look at the cow in front of the stupas with scooters whizzing in the foreground and a mass of electrical wires overhead. It's the last night on the boat, sadly, and we're having a cocktail party with pina coladas and apparently there's going to be dancing. <laughs> Are you going to dance? All of the crew are gathering to say goodbye to us and to join us in the final dance party. The crew teach us how to do traditional Cambodian dancing with the hands, though I'm not too sure that we've quite got it. Jerry seems to think he has, though. What he lacks in technique, he makes up for in enthusiasm. And just as we've all started to master it and we're even managing to dance a traditional dance in formation, Jerry puts a bit of a spanner in the works. And wait, is that Scott Mann? Or is it John Travolta? I can't tell. Something tells me the crew won't be forgetting us in a hurry. It's the end of the cruise and we're about to leave the boat and we've just discovered that we're probably the last boat up the Mekong. Vietnam and Cambodia have cancelled all future cruises until the coronavirus epidemic is somehow more under control. I feel so sorry for the staff here. We passed a boat that was in quarantine yesterday because some British people had the virus aboard it and that's really panicked the local authorities. But our flight out of Cambodia doesn't leave until tomorrow, which means we have one night of holiday left and we're going to go and visit Angkor Wat. One last hurrah. Thank you. We're on our way to Angkor Wat and I will show you that magnificent temple and the temple of Taprom in next week's video. Well, it's not every day I see a chef carrying my luggage. That is very nice of him. And he's an amazing chef, I can tell you that much. Uh, it's been full of highs. One or two little lows worried about are we going to get back in time? But I must say, the crew, everybody has been superb. <laughs> and next time you speak to me, I'll be in the UK. <laughs> did they, did they photobomb? No, I don't know what you're talking about. 